The year is 1687. The people of Athens are under siege. Unknown to them, enemy cannon line a hill overlooking one of the world's most magnificent buildings, the Parthenon. Tragically, the Parthenon had been used to store, of all things, gunpowder. One of the most beautiful buildings ever conceived, it was almost completely destroyed. For 2,000 years, the Parthenon has stood overlooking Athens, recalling a remarkable moment in history, the Golden Age of Greece. The city-states of ancient Greece were all highly competitive, but there was one state that expected to win and usually did. It was the powerful, brilliant, daring city of Athens. During the 5th century BC, Athens grew more powerful as many city-states and islands turned to her for protection from their mutual enemy, the Persians. And so the Athenian Empire was born. The Acropolis in Athens represents a pinnacle of achievement in the history of Western civilizations, an extraordinary outpouring of creative excellence that derives from one century, the fifth century before Christ. These magnificent buildings symbolize the collective inspiration of a people with a passion for perfection. The historian Plutarch wrote, So the buildings rose, as imposing in their sheer size as they were inimitable in the grace of their outlines. Since the artists tried to excel themselves in the beauty of their workmanship, each of them men supposed would take many generations to build. But in fact, the entire project was carried through in the high summer of one man's administration. That one man was Pericles, leader of the Athenians. Pericles built the Parthenon to house and honor the deity to whom the city was dedicated, the goddess Athena. In her hand was a six-foot statue of victory. Adorned in gold and ivory, Athena soared 39 feet high. Pericles came to power in 461 BC. Athens flourished as few cities ever have. Pericles paid for the magnificence of all of Athens out of taxes collected from other city-states in return for protection. Ours is no workaday city. No other provides so many recreations of the spirit. Our love of what is beautiful does not make us soft. We regard wealth as something to be properly used rather than as something to boast about. To me, it's wonderful that in the age of Pericles, they would take what was a huge amount of their gross national product and pour it into buildings, into a great Parthenon, into architecture that has influenced the history of architecture in the West for centuries beyond. What the Acropolis and the Parthenon were saying to the world was that we are Athens, we are the top, we have this goddess whom we revere, who looks after us under all circumstances, and for whom we are going to build the most magnificent and 
closure we can imagine. And it, it was a mark both of respect to the goddess and a way of showing the other Greeks that in this constant struggle, this constant competition, Athens was the best. The city was completed within 50 years, designed by the finest architects in Greece and adorned by the greatest Greek sculptor, Phidias. It was a workforce that brought together the best craftsmen from all over the Mediterranean. Athens buzzed with new energy and, most of all, new ideas. Evening parties were occasions not to just watch pretty girls dance or to get drunk, but to talk. The star guest would be the brilliant philosopher Socrates. Usually all male affairs, there was one interesting exception. Foreign women seized in war often became captive entertainers. One particularly clever and beautiful courtesan was Aspasia. Pericles fell deeply in love with her and shocked everyone by marrying her. Even Socrates was said to love her company. It must have been mind-blowing to be part of that atmosphere of the fifth century in Greece. So much was being invented that we have inherited. We think now in terms of Greek words, philosophy and rhetoric and politics and geography and biology. All of these things were just being discovered and discussed. Everyone was questioning. These were the first people to calculate the position of the earth, moon and stars and the first to conceive of the atom. The classic age of Greece produced some of the world's greatest and most original minds. The philosophers Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the mathematician Pythagoras, the poet Pindar, the playwrights Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Aristophanes, the historian Herodotus, and the father of medicine, Hippocrates. These were some of the greatest minds that have ever lived, and they were all alive in this small town, more or less at the same time. In Athens, Pericles presided over the world's first democracy. Although only the 30,000 male citizens had the vote, all officers of the city were elected, and their deliberations were held in public. It was an idea that outlived the kings and tyrants of succeeding centuries to emerge again in the democracies of the modern world. Our founding fathers knew Latin and Greek. They read the authors. They understood the classical tradition of a rule of law against tyranny. I never cease to be amazed at the originality of the Greeks in inventing, really, democracy as we know it. It didn't exist before. They were tyrants and tribal leaders, but public participation in governance, in decision-making on the part of citizens started really with the fifth century in Athens. Particularly under this extraordinary leader, Pericles, there was an opportunity for citizens to participate. It wasn't we, they. Everyone had to do it. Everyone had to give part of their time to be experienced in government. And you had majority rule. You had public debate. Everybody got into the act. Athenian success in art and diplomacy, in sports and in government, was motivated by their desire for excellence. Ultimately, it was a spiritual commitment, this passion for perfection. Acropolis, it is not the house of a governor. It is not an administrative center. And it is not a shopping center as well. It was the temple of uh, Athena, of a goddess, they wanted to serve, they wanted to create something above themselves, above their height. 
it wasn't like a modern church. It wasn't a place where you would go in and worship quietly. The sacrifices were performed outside, in part for hygienic reasons, after all. If you're slaughtering a bull, you don't want it on the floor of your temple. But also because the smoke had to rise to the gods. And in the meantime, since the divinity was thought to dwell in his or her home, you didn't want to get too close. You wanted to maintain a kind of deferential or respectful distance, lest inadvertently you might do something wrong and get somebody very powerful really angry at you, and that's always a bad idea. In 1928, off the northern coast of the Greek island of Euboa, in the Aegean Sea, a small boat was looking for sponges. The diver saw a strange shape beneath the sand. He had discovered a classical Greek statue that had sunk with the ship carrying it nearly 2,000 years before. Many now believe this rare bronze was Poseidon, Greek god of the sea. The magnificent statue was one of hundreds stolen in the first and second centuries AD by the Romans. Gods like Poseidon were thought to have a very real power over the lives of ancient Greeks. Overlooking the sea at Sunion, 37 miles south of Athens, is a temple built in honor of Poseidon, a god the Greeks were anxious to have on their side. Poseidon is nature. His domains are the depths of the earth and the sea. He creates storms. He helps the seamen or he sends them to their death. So he's an uncontrollable god. And you turn to him when you're scared. The Greeks were very good in building temples where you had a sense of otherness, a sense of such a great beauty that only the gods could live there. Up on Mount Olympus lived the pantheon of Greek gods. There were gods for everything, love, fertility, wisdom, anger, jealousy. But one Greek god stood above the rest, the all-powerful Zeus, ruler of the world and of the gods themselves. These gods were not imagined as spiritual beings. They had very human characteristics and were known to interfere in the lives of humans on the slightest whim. They could be rational and helpful, or mischievous and vindictive. Anyone who offended them could expect terrible vengeance. This is Delphi, the most important of all Greek sanctuaries to the gods. This temple was dedicated to Apollo, the god of knowledge, light, music, and healing. Greeks honored Apollo with plays, debates, poetry readings, and in this stadium near the top of the mountain, great sporting events. Pilgrims would cleanse themselves in this spring, having first sacrificed a goat to Apollo. Even in this highly educated and rational civilization, 
they still believed in mysterious divine powers. The great temple of Apollo was home to a kind of prophet, the Oracle of Delphi. Its pronouncements could affect the destiny of men and the history of nations. Ordinary citizens would come to ask if they should marry or if their spouse was being unfaithful. Generals would ask if they should go to war. A priest took their questions to the Oracle, or Pythia, as she was called. The medium was an ordinary local woman sent into a trance often by chewing hallucinogenic leaves. Her answers were always garbled messages that the priest would interpret more ambiguously still, leaving supplicants to choose the meaning that suited them best. At times, the answers were simply misunderstood. When Croesus, king of Lydia, asked if he should attack the Persian Empire, he was told, if you go to war, you'll destroy a great kingdom. He went to war. The kingdom he destroyed was his own. Greek sanctuaries were bursting with life, and we shouldn't imagine them as pristine with their white temples and clean-robed priests. There were vendors there, there were uh, musicians, there were camping grounds around the temples, so everything was full of life. Thousands of people came to Delphi every four years for a five-day festival. Moving up the sacred way to Apollo's temple, passing 3,000 statues and treasuries filled with the riches of various city-states. Pilgrims were expected to offer whatever they could afford. It was even said that King Midas sent his own solid gold throne, all in the name of honoring Apollo. But it was also at Delphi that another unofficial ritual took place, honoring not Apollo, but a very different sort of god. In winter, it said, women would climb Mount Parnassus directly behind Delphi and perform wild dances in honor of Dionysus, god of wine. They were called maenads. It was one of the few opportunities for women in this highly ordered society to follow their instincts and abandon all inhibitions. Maenads were followers of Dionysus, so to say liberated women <laughs> who leave the household and go out in a completely female bond atmosphere. And they do dances and picnics, probably harmless things, but because they do it by themselves, the male imagination made them do monster things. Uh, they thought that they were fornicating and having orgies and uh, eating raw meat and so on. Such private rituals later became public events and the beginnings of what we now know as theater. All drama originated as part of religious festivals. And they had the god Dionysus, who was the god of everything delicious. And people used to go out and celebrate. And this led to poetry, the dithram. And then they introduced male figures in masks. And gradually, you got what we now think of as tragedy and comedy. This amphitheater at Delphi is one of hundreds built by the ancient Greeks. Here, plays were produced that are still performed today. Many were about women. Eula Gavala is a well-known Greek actress who has played most of the female roles in the classical plays. Most of the women were kept at home. But uh, they were very powerful personalities. They were running the house and the lives of their husbands. Eula is preparing to rehearse Medea, one of many plays about the terrible things that happen when a woman's passions are unleashed. Of course, this woman power closed into those beautiful houses was mysterious, too, for men. It was that other world that they wanted to know more, experience more. And 
that's why they chose women as their heroines for their plays. Theatre became absolutely central to a way of life. They would have a whole day. You'd start in the morning, you'd get three plays, and they went on a long time. Uh, you had subsidy from the government, and you also had private support from the very rich. And you had political debate. You had a sense of involvement. The chorus was a device that represented the people. And uh, the stories were often known from mythology, but it was the way they were played out that really captured the imagination of an entire populace. Passion is the way to courage! Medea is about a woman driven to unspeakable acts of revenge when her husband betrays her for his own personal gain. You could have stayed in Corinth. Medea refuses to accept her husband Jason's decision to abandon her in favor of the king's daughter. Instead, you talked like a fool. And now what? And now you're banished. The tragedy of Medea is that she gives up everything for Jason. And in a male-dominated society, she's powerless to prevent him deserting her and her children. Traces of that tension between men and women can still be seen in Greece today. This too is a society dominated by men. Men committed to demonstrating their masculinity. No women are performing in any roles in this summer festival, not even dancing. Men do whatever they like, the women remain passive bystanders. Athens has been described as a boys club and in some ways this is very, very true. Women, resident foreigners, slaves, were not fully enfranchised and they were somehow lesser beings. It was the boys in the boys club that ran the show and they wanted to keep it that way. And to some long-suffering women, men still seem to be running the show. Coward. I saved your life, and every Greek aboard the Argo knows it. And after I endured all that, you call to another woman. Jason, where am I to go? In her desperation, Medea reaches a tragic conclusion that her only possible revenge is to kill her own children. Well, you take a play like Medea, which so speaks to a society now in which divorce is rampant, in which men and women get so angry at each other, in which child custody is a central issue, and you see it played out with an intensity of emotion that absolutely brings you to tears. Women like Medea, um, Helen, there are women that we see even today. We women, we have today the same problems. Problems with the relationship with men, in our family with husbands. Each age has its own beauty, a youth that lies in the possession of a body able to endure all kinds of contests, whether of the race course or of bodily strength. While the young man himself is a pleasant delight to behold, 
To the Greeks, a beautiful body was as important as a brilliant mind. It was in this stadium where the Nemean Games were held, one of the four great religious and athletic festivals of ancient Greece. The original stadium held 20,000 spectators. The site was excavated by Professor Stephen Miller, who is restaging the games. I'm not going to do that. His heralds have to be coached and dressed. Anybody have a safety pin? In the original games, the officials would have been chosen from each city-state. I, 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 I used to get a dinner, you know, before this happened. Can I tell <laughs> the ancient Greeks did not take weekends off. They worked every day except for the more than 50 religious holidays and sporting festivals. They'd come in, clusters of family or friends, uh, spread their blankets, break out their wineskins, and sit and watch uh, the games. Uh, you should also imagine cheering sections. We have actually uh, found evidence in the form of concentrations of coins that show us, for example, uh, across the way, it was the center of the Corinthian cheering section. It's almost all of the coins that have come out of the stadium from Corinth uh, are there. Here on the opposite side, uh, just behind where the judges stand is, not coincidentally, uh, we have found almost all of our coins from Argos. And of course, the games were controlled by Argos. So you have the cheering section right behind the judges stand reinforcing, I'm sure, the judges' decisions. At the stadium site, Miller made a remarkable discovery, a starting line with holes in it. From this, he reconstructed the ancient starting mechanism, the Hisplex. I think you can hear the torsion. And what we have is a mechanism that, like the elbow when the arm is straight up, falls forward. And I think it's important to listen to the smack that it makes when it hits. Ropes were held in front of the athletes by posts that an official would drop simultaneously releasing the competitors. Okay, ready, set, go. Originally, athletes competed in the nude and women were excluded from the games. But one woman determined to see her son compete dressed up as a male trainer. When her son won, she jumped over a fence in her excitement. All was revealed. After that, even trainers were required to be in the nude. Long jumpers carried weights that would thrust them forward and were jettisoned before landing. In this way, they could add up to a foot to each jump. Winners won no prizes other than laurel or wild celery wreaths. Back home, they'd be showered with flowers at lavish parades where they'd be drawn around town in the finest chariots. Often, they'd have a statue made in their likeness. If they were Athenian, they'd enjoy free dinners for the rest of their lives. The most important games in Greece were held every four years in this valley, at Olympia. The first international sporting event in all the world was held here in 776 BC. The Greeks were the first to elevate athletics to the status of serious competition. Even our word athlete comes from the Greek word athlos or contest. But the Olympic festival was first and foremost a religious occasion. As many as a hundred oxen would be sacrificed here on an altar in front of the temple of Zeus. Its interior was dominated by a gold-clad statue of the god. Before it, every Greek athlete had to pray before he competed. At the entrance to Olympia was the gymnasium where athletes trained, and the office of the organizing committee who decided on an athlete's moral suitability to compete. A hotel for VIPs was built around an elegant fountain. At the far end was a mini United Nations. States were required to cease all hostilities during the games and met here to work out their differences. Central to everything, was the great temple of Zeus. 
you didn't go just for the athletics, you went for the religious festival, you went to sacrifice to Zeus, you went to talk to people you knew from Argos or Sparta or Athens or Thebes. Herodotus might come and read the latest chapter of his histories to see if it was going to sell. Uh, Pindar was waiting in the wings for an athlete to win so he could get a commission to write a poem. Uh, Myron the sculptor was here uh, hoping uh, to get a commission to do a sculpture uh, of a victorious athlete. Mind and body came together in the gymnasium. This was a place for conversation and learning as much as for exercise and wrestling. To the Greeks, the aesthetic, the physical, and the intellectual were all part of their pursuit of perfection. The philosopher Philostratus wrote, Dust from terracotta is good for opening closed pores for perspiration, but yellow dust also adds glisten and is a delight to see on a nice body which is in good shape. With so much emphasis on male intimacy and physical beauty, perhaps it was inevitable that in Athens, homosexuality was quite common with no stigma attached whatsoever. Sexual relations between mature single men and younger boys were entirely acceptable as long as the boys were first wooed with gifts and as long as it stopped with marriage. Admiration among men was best reflected in the world of athletics. Stephen Miller found some interesting graffiti in the tunnel at Nemea. Perhaps one that stands out the most clearly is uh, Epicrates Kalos. Epicrates is beautiful. And if we look over here at, at another graffito, we have the same name, Acrodotos is beautiful. Of course, not everybody agreed. Somebody came along later and scrapped, scratched the Greek phrase, two graps on tos, which is the rough equivalent of our modern expression, says who. Cortes is beautiful, says who. The Olympic torch still glows today, if not always with the same strong, clear flame that inspired those athletes 2,500 years ago. But it does sometimes carry forward the original goal that once every four years the nations of the world should forget their disputes and come together in friendship and open competition. The Athenians tended to dominate in sports and just about everything else, but their winning streak couldn't last forever. And fate was preparing to deal some cruel blows to this society which had risen so high and achieved so much. In 399 BC, the Athenians did a strange thing they put their wisest citizen on trial. The great philosopher Socrates was judged by a jury of 200 of his fellow citizens. Each placed a pebble in one urn for guilty or another for innocent. He was accused of not believing in the gods and of corrupting the minds of the young with his radical new ideas. In many ways, Socrates was the complete Athenian. He served with courage and distinction as a soldier and as a statesman, and in this way fulfilled the Athenian ideal. At the same time, though, he demanded explanations, he demanded definitions of his fellow citizens. 
He described himself, after all, as a gadfly, as a stinging fly on the great sluggish rump of the Athenian party politic. Socrates was found guilty. He was sentenced to death by poison. His trial and conviction would never have happened earlier under Pericles' rule. The Athenians became too cautious, I think. Something happened. Their old willingness to engage, to experiment, to explore is still there, but it's somehow muted. The change in Athens had its root in events decades earlier. In 430 BC, a terrible tragedy befell Athens. A plague that was said to have come from Ethiopia, then passed through Egypt and Persia before finally reaching Athens. It was a disease that killed almost everyone it touched, and it swept through the city. The historian Plutarch wrote, there was no record of the disease being so virulent anywhere else as it was in Athens. People in perfect health suddenly began to have burning feelings in the head. Their eyes became red and inflamed. Some, too, went blind and suffered from total loss of memory. Pericles' own sister, and then to his horror, his son, caught the plague and he was already burdened by a disastrous war with the Spartans. Heracles had brought the entire population of the Athenian countryside within the great walls of Athens, and sanitation, one can be sure, was primitive, and a disease like the plague spread like wildfire. As it did, its effects were no less devastating morally than physically. All the old laws, the things that the Athenians had relied on to hold their society together, were shredded. People came into temples to die, or worse still, brought their own dead in and left them there. The horror, I think, is really, to us, almost unimaginable. Inside, there was a feeling of burning. Many of the sick who were uncared for actually plunged into the water tanks in an effort to relieve the thirst. It was unquenchable. The plague affected Pericles in two ways. First of all, politically, because the Athenians blamed him for it. And for the first time in 15 years, he was not elected to the office of generalship that he had held for so long. Shortly thereafter, he himself caught the plague and died. And with the death of Pericles, a certain style of leadership died as well. A third of the population would die. Without Pericles' leadership, the Athenians were lost. They started to make reckless decisions. For half a century, Athens battled Sparta for dominance over Greece. The decisive battle would be fought not on Greek soil, but in Sicily. Athens sent a fleet into battle, but the highly trained Spartan army sided with the Sicilians. The Athenian navy was destroyed in a series of disastrous sea battles, and in 404 BC, Athens was utterly defeated. I think finally the Athenians lost the great war against Sparta because they did overreach themselves. The Spartans repeatedly offered terms of peace, but here's where that old Athenian aggressiveness comes into play as well. The Athenians simply couldn't allow themselves to accept terms of peace from Sparta. They wanted to win. The defeat of the Athenians in Sicily left Sparta as the dominant power in Greece. Athens had everything going for it. 
but I think that it declined for many of the same reasons that made it great. That aggressiveness, that competitiveness, that need to be first and best, wore them out. The goddess to whom the Athenians turned for protection was powerless to help them. This relief is called Mourning Athena. Socrates became the scapegoat for the decline of Athens. In prison, his friends offered to help him escape, but he refused. Plato wrote, He said he had lived in Athens all his life. For 70 years he had been content with the city and its people. Why should he now run away from it like the lowest slave? The hemlock leaves were crushed. The poison potion was prepared. Socrates really does embody Athens at its best in some ways. And when he dies, we really do see that things have changed that things after Socrates just won't be the same. Plato recorded the last words of his friend and teacher. How much would one of you give to meet Orpheus or Homer? I should like to spend my time there, as here, in examining and searching people's minds to find out who is wise and who only thinks he is. Socrates' ideas live on to this day, but over time his beloved Athens became part of other empires. The Macedonians, the Romans, the Ottoman Turks. In 1971, its crowning glory, the Parthenon, was discovered to be in danger of final collapse. Today it is being restored, not to its former splendor, but as a magnificent ruin worthy of the civilization it represents. The pieces of marble so cruelly shattered by cannon fire are being painstakingly cleaned and carefully reassembled. The holes made by enemy cannonballs are being precisely filled in. The restoration will take even longer than the 15 years it originally took to build the Parthenon. After its destruction in 1687, the temple was pillaged by treasure seekers. The Turks who ruled Athens at the time were easily bribed. Any passing visitor with enough money could walk away with one of the great sculptures. Heads and limbs were severed from bodies to make even more saleable items. All over Europe, eager salesmen offered their plundered treasure to museums and private collectors. When a young English aristocrat, Lord Elgin, arrived in 1803, this was the situation he felt justified his removing any remaining sculptures. His men pried loose 56 sections of friezes and a dozen or so statues, including a magnificent horse's head. It took 22 ships to carry the marbles to Britain. One was wrecked en route. The Elgin marbles from the Parthenon are exhibited in the British Museum. I entered a very large room, and there I saw the beauty that overwhelmed me of these Elgin marbles. Uh, 
I got so excited. I had goose pimples all over my body. Uh, I couldn't speak. I was just in a trance. The beauty was so powerful. I was silent for a very long time looking at that beauty. And then I felt sad because I couldn't see in my country those marbles. It's very sad for us not to have that great experience here in Athens every day. We need uh, to see Parthenon, to see Acropolis, to touch it. It is a reminder of what we have achieved. The exercise of uh, reaching to the perfect was done. And if uh, we can assume for a moment that uh, all these ruins, remnants, are disappeared, erased from the earth, it would be like a universe without the Fifth uh, Symphony of Beethoven, for example. But there is a quality more durable even than stone in the legacy of Athens. This was a city whose brilliant light shone so powerfully that it defined Western intellectual thought for centuries. It is hard to go down a street without seeing some vestige of our enthusiasm for a Greek way of life. And we forget that way of life at our peril. It was so effective and so courageous. It's extraordinary that a society of only 70,000 Athenian men and women who lived 500 years before Christ could influence the world so dramatically. The democratic spark they lit blazed again 2,000 years later to affect the lives of people all over the world. This, then, is the kind of city for which men who could not bear the thought of losing her nobly fought and died. Mighty indeed are the marks and monuments of our empire which we have left. Future ages will wonder at us as the present age wonders at us now.